Assalamu alaikum. Today we are going to begin with lecture 4, but it is a continuation of the previous lecture that we had on Tintin Abbey by William Wordsworth. I discussed with you the first part of the poem in uh, the previous lecture, and today we are going to look at the last part of that lecture. Before I uh, look at the text again analy and analyze it with you bit by bit, I think I'm going to go back and uh, we will just do a recap of what we learned uh, about this poem in the previous lecture. What was it that Wordsworth was talking about in Tintin Abbey? And how was it that he expressed his uh, uh, deepening relationship with nature? And what, was, what were the motivating factors and uh, what were the th uh, things that actually touched his heart and what were the things that actually determined his relationship with nature. Actually these were the things that uh, we looked at and these were the things that he described in his own poem and uh, they are evolved and they are developed in this particular poem. So let's see, let's, let's just recap what were they. If you remember, uh, he begins the poem with, uh, with a brief uh, description of the scene before him. He is visiting this place, Abbey, and he is visiting this place after a, after a span of five years. He had visited this place five years early, and uh, now he was visiting it again with his sister, Dorothy. So on the first visit, he was alone. And he had seen the natural beauty and he had uh, rejoiced in the natural surroundings all by himself. He did not have a companion, he did not have company then with him. Upon the second visit, he does have a co companion and that is his sister, Dorothy. He is now enjoying the beauteous forms of nature along with his sister. And he, when he visits this place again the second time, he is now comparing his feelings for nature as they were when he visited this place the first time and he is comparing them to as they are now upon his second visit. And this is what the whole poem is about. It is an evaluation of his own feelings for nature. It is a systematic and a gradual development of his relationship with nature, uh, but that is how he explores it by offering us with a comparison between his previous feelings, between his previous relationship with nature and his new, newly developed and newly formed relationship with nature. So he starts by giving us a brief uh, description of the scene that is before him. He does not talk about the Abbey, I told you it's a small, it's a church. Uh, so he doesn't talk about the church at all, he only talks about the natural scene that is before him. He does talk about the river, the river Y that runs through this place and uh, he in fact even uh, calls it by, mm, calls it a spirit because he says it has murmured something to him, it sp the river speaks to him, the flowing streams speak to Wordsworth, they seem to say something to him. So he describes the, the tall, steep cliffs for you. He describes the cottages, the gardens, the orchards uh, with unripe fruits. He describes uh, to you the sycamore tree. He, he tells you about uh, the hermit's cave. He tells you about uh, the vagabond's uh, cottages. He tells you about the wreaths of smoke rising up uh, from the chimneys of, uh, of some uh, vagabond. So he is, he describes to you the scene and he just does not give you a bare description of the scene, he tells you about his feelings for that scene, he tells you how he felt because through a device that he uses and that is repetition. So he uh, uses certain repetitions uh, to emphasize that feeling of happiness, that feeling of uh, pleasure uh, at being back at this place again. So uh, Wordsworth is uh, actually enjoying being back in this natural place. And it's like uh, it, with any one of us, we, uh, any, any, any place which has been part of our life, when we visit it again, we rejoice. We rejoice in the minor changes that we see that have taken place there. We rejoice 
uh, so we especially rejoice to see if the changes, if there have been no changes and the things uh, are as they were before, as it is for Wordsworth. When he visits this place again, he see, feels that the natural beauty has not changed. Nature still has uh, as much to offer as it did then. It is still wild, it is still secluded, it is still untouched by industrialization, that, that ugliness that was destroying the city life. So he is pleased, he is actually pleased to see, uh, to be back where he felt he actually belonged. And then in the next part, remember, he moved on to describe his separation from this place. He talks about uh, uh, that part of his life when he was separated from this place, this Tintin Abbey, and uh, those five years that he spent in the city life. And he says, whenever he was oppressed, whenever he was depressed, whenever he was uh, tensed, he would look back at these happy memories and they would make him pleased. They would make him happy. And this was what uh, uh, br brought solace, brought peace to Wordsworth's uh, mind. And uh, Wordsworth's, and this is what he describes as uh, nature's gift, nature's gift to him this tranquility, uh, this, uh, this peace, this solace uh, that it bestows upon individuals who uh, love it, who care for it. This is a gift. This is the gift that nature gives to its uh, uh, lovers. Wordsworth then talks about the other gifts that nature has given him. And that other gift, he says, is a special gift. And that is, uh, he says, a bless it is a blessed mood. It is the blessed mood, and that is where he becomes a mystic. From the poet Wordsworth, as I said in the last lecture, he becomes a mystic uh, Wordsworth. He is now contemplating, he is now uh, thinking about his relationship with nature. And he says, for those who meditate upon nature, who meditate in nature, uh, they can actually connect with the spirit of the nature. And when they connect with the spirit of the nature, they can see into the mysteries of life. Everything, uh, all the mysteries are opened up for them. They can see into the, into the uh, depths of things, uh, like some divine, like some deity, like some uh, divine being. All the mysteries are open for them. So he describes that process to you when he's in that blessed mood. What happens when the material, the corporeal frame, he says, when the physical body uh, that becomes immaterial, uh, uh, that does not matter, and the poet is only connected to his soul, and through his soul, he is connected to the soul of the world, to the spirit of the world. So, when, when the physical objects are forgotten, when the physical beauty of the nature is uh, set aside, when the physical uh, being of an individual is set aside, and both the souls meet, it is then that he says that all the burdens are lightened, all the tensions are forgotten, and there is only bliss, there is only happiness, and there is only union, there is only unity. This is uh, a deep concept of mysticism, and I told you that we can associate well with it because uh, it is to be found in all religions. In fact, as I will discuss uh, in towards the last part of my lecture today, there are some modern writers who are also exploring the similar theme and they talk about this union with the, uh, between the soul of an individual and the soul of the universe and how that uh, can resolve a problem. So I will look at, discuss that with you, but later. Then we saw that Wordsworth, uh, uh, from this flashback he comes back into the present time and when he comes back to the present time he is. Uh, he tells you again uh, how this place, how this place is for him now, and uh, how it was for him when he first visited this place. And then he makes that comparison, and he tells us that then he was. It was only the animal pleasures. It was. It was the source of his emotional needs. It used to. Nature used to fill up his emotional need. Nature used to fill up his physical need. And that was all that nature meant to him. It was all its only its beauteous forms mattered, and uh, not its the, uh, not its moral, intellectual, or the philosophical side. But now he says, as an adult, as a mature person, when he's visiting this place, things have changed. 
he has now he now sees the moral the f intellectual and the philosophical aspects of nature and he uh, uh, realizes that nature uh, has all these gifts that nature uh, bestows man uh, uh, with a moral character makes improves a person's character makes him a better person and uh, makes him a better human being it also it uh, you know there is a philosophical aspect to that also when he says nature helps man connect to the other human beings and because he becomes better he can uh, find solutions to their problems he is no no more a selfish uh, uh, individual who's only looking towards its his own needs but he becomes an individual who wants to reach out to others and who wants to help uh, re um, alleviate pains of other individuals that so this is the development of his uh, 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 serious moral intellectual and philosophical relationship with nature and uh, Wordsworth sees in nature a spirit then he says he he, he says after uh, I, I felt that you know I mean nature has so much to give he says I have no he, he feels that he has uh, he can op openly uh, express that there is a spirit in nature but remember he never uses the word God he doesn't say that there is God in nature I will also discuss pantheism in detail with you towards the end of this lecture but you see he's only he's not talking about uh, that deity uh, as we uh, as we talk about in monotheist religions uh, of God the God Almighty with capital G but he's talking about a deity a spirit he is talking about the soul of the world he's talking about the soul of the universe but that which is not essentially God so he, he feels a presence in nature he says he feels a spirit in nature and he says this nature does not have one specific place to live it lives everywhere because he says it's, its dwelling is in the setting sun its dwelling is the blue sky and it's everywhere he says it is everywhere you remember those lines you can look up those lines again and you will see how he says that it is everywhere the whole universe is filled up with that presence with that with that deity with that God and um, so he towards the end of that uh, particular part uh, and he goes on to describe the different roles of nature for you he says how nature uh, assumes different roles in your lives sometimes when you need a teacher it becomes a teacher when you need a guide it becomes a guide when you need uh, a mother it becomes a mother when you need um, a nurse it is a nurse so nature has has all those different ro roles uh, a nature he says it is a soul of all my moral being he says I he it's he he says I am indebted so much indebted to nature that I owe everything all that I am is because of nature so up till here uh, this is a large chunk of this poem but I did it all with you in the previous lecture because it is all connected it is all related to his uh, relationship with uh, nature and how uh, it develops it deepens and uh, this was why although it may have been too much for you but I discussed it all uh, together because it is all connected and it was all part of one uh, whole thing and naturally from the examination point of view uh, the this relationship that uh, with nature that Wordsworth is uh, you know speaks so highly of is very important so this is one whole chunk where he is talking about his association deepening relationship with nature and uh, uh, how he sees it uh, how it is it was different from his previous uh, exposure to nature and how it has evolved now today I am going to look at the last fourth part of the poem with you and it is in this part of the poem that he uh, feels he says that he's indebted to another person but this time it's a person so f first part the, the part that I did in the previous lecture that was his uh, uh, indebtedness to nature it was all about nature so this part you can say is a de is dedication is dedicated to his sister Dorothy 
So he is going to talk about his relationship with his sister Dorothy here. And uh, it is also important because you will see how Wordsworth describes it as an important relationship, but with respect to nature once again. They are both uh, parentless at this time. Uh, so, uh, uh, Wordsworth talks about the nature's influence on both of them as if nature is their parent. As if, uh, because Wordsworth at one time is going to talk about his own death uh, when he is not there and sister Dor his sister Dorothy has to live all by herself. He says, she must gain strength from nature. So, nature assumes the role of a parent here, of uh, uh, of a parent for Wordsworth and his sister Dorothy. So again, a significant part of the poem. So I'm going to look at that second point, second part, uh, next part of uh, the lecture here. And again, I'm going to do uh, a line by line analysis so that uh, you understand the whole thing in detail. So let's begin with that part. He says, nor perchance if I were not thus taught, should I the more suffer my genial spirits to decay? Even as yet, he is talking about, uh, he's just concluding, he's talking about his relationship with nature and he's just concluding it. Uh, he says, Ke, it's not without chance, it's not, not per chance, it's, he says, I have been schooled, I have been taught by nature. And uh, if I had not thus been uh, taught by nature, he says, I would have been nobody. I would have decayed. And so he's wondering if uh, uh, what would have happened to him if he did not recognize nature's blessings. Okay. Now comes the part where Dorothy is introduced. And he introduces her f uh, first as a friend. I will first read out the lines for you. He says, For thou art with me here upon the banks of this fair river. And remember the river is the river Y. Thou my dearest friend, my dear dear friend. So he repeats just like in the first, if you re recall the first part of the poem when he's back here in Tintin Abbey again and he is saying five long years, five summers, he's repeating five, 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 because he's emphasizing uh, his return, his feelings. Here again he, he uh, repeats, and this repetition highlights his uh, relationship with nature. He says, for thou art with me. Look at his uh, feeling of happiness. He says, I'm glad. He means that he's glad that Dorothy is with him upon the banks of this fair river. First it was a silver, sylvan river, the, the spirit, now he says a fair river. And he says thou, thou means you. He says thou, my dearest friend, and then my dear, dear friend. So Dorothy is not his sister alone. She is a friend. So a friend, he calls her a friend because she shares his feelings. She shares his emotions. So it's, she's a friend because uh, he can confide in her. He can share his feelings with her. So she's more than a sister to him. And such is the importance of Dorothy in his life. Then he says, and in thy voice I catch the language of my former heart and read my former pleasures in the shooting of thy wild eyes. Oh, Yet a little while may I behold in thee what I once was, my dear, dear sister. So you see he says, he is now connecting her, you can say, to nature. Remember he used the word wild, secluded, uh, use, he uses the word wild for nature, for the beauties of nature a lot. The wild, uh, the wild hedges, the hedges going wild. They, have, they, are, they are beautiful for Wordsworth because they are unkept, because they are not trimmed. So they are, so they are beautiful. This wildness has a beauty for Wordsworth. But first he says, in thy voice, in your voice, I catch. He says, the language of my former heart. He says, when I hear you talking 
about and describing uh, this uh, this place to me naturally words of dorothy remember please that the dorothy was visiting this place for the first time it was words for second visit but it was dorothy's first visit so she uh, uh, like his uh, like her brother she was also fond of nature she uh, also took pleasure when she was surrounded by nature so uh, upon visiting this place she must have uh, expressed to wordsworth how happy she was also to see those beauteous forms and how the beauty of this place uh, also held magic for him like it did for his wordsworth so he says when i hear your voice when i hear you talk i feel that you're talking in the same way as i used to former means previous past so he says you to you talk in the same way as i used to feel uh, about nature in my past and read my former pleasures in the shooting of thy wild eyes he says why he calls him wild not because she's sick or something but he calls her eyes wild because they're excited she's excited she's happy so he says the eyes have a wild light about them so he says when i look at you when i hear your voice or when i look into your eyes i remember my own former pleasures my pleasures of the past oh yet a little while may i behold in thee what i was once so this is the first time where we hear words with longing to feel like his sister is feeling now to be like he was in the past uh like uh, like when like when like a roe he bounded over the mountains when nature did not have that uh did not share that philosophical intellectual link with uh with him so he says oh may i for once i would like to uh, share or be part of your happiness and he says and this prayer i make then he makes a prayer for her knowing that nature never did betray the heart that loved her it is a privilege through all the years of this our life to lead from joy to joy this is important because he says that nature never did betray the heart that loved her so he says he is making he is going to make a prayer for her sister and before he makes a prayer he says uh, nature does not betray anyone because i love nature and you love nature so nature will always be uh, with us and what is the second advantage what is the second privilege of nature she it he says that it leads from joy to joy and because it does never betrays naturally you can connect but uh, because it does not betray you because it does not betray your feelings it always stays the same its love all for you always stays the same naturally you are always led on from one joy to the next joy so there there is only joy in your life there is no sadness because nature does not betray there is no betrayal and when there is no betrayal there is no sadness naturally there is always joy so nature you can see here is uh, uh is is giving off joy is a source of pleasure for she she is nature she can so inform the mind that is within us so impress with quietness and beauty and so feed with lofty thoughts again you can connect this stanza to the different roles of nature he says nature can inform the mind nature can so inform us so here nature is an informant nature is a teacher who informs us who gives us knowledge uh, how teaches us about things she so impresses with quietness and beauty so it is a beautiful piece of art it is beauty to look at so uh, it leaves a deep impression upon our minds and it feeds with lofty thoughts and uh, another another uh, uh, role of nature is that it is like a nurse it or you know uh, it looks after us but it also providing us with this is lofty like sublime thoughts lofty thoughts so not base but lofty thoughts so 
so much does nature give us, he says, it gives us, it informs the mind, it impresses with quietness and beauty and it feels with lofty thoughts. So much, he says, that nature gives us, that he says, that neither evil tongues, rash judgments, nor the sneers of selfish men, nor greetings where no kindness is, nor all the dreary intercourse of daily life shall ever prevail against us or disturb our cheerful faith that all which we behold is full of blessings. So I have highlighted for you uh, what uh, aspects Wordsworth is describing. He says, neither evil tongues, nor rash judgments, nor the sneers of selfish men, nor greetings where there is no kindness, nor dreary intercourse of daily lives. So all these things, he says, cannot have an effect on us. They cannot influence us. Evil tongues are the, uh, are the are maybe you can say backbiting, people, the mischievous activities of people, um, people who are jealous of us, people who are talking behind our backs. So he says we are not, when we have nature as our, uh, as a support with us, when we have nature to guide us, when we have nature uh, to teach us, when we have nature to nurse us, nothing can happen to us, Not, nobody can affect us. Not the evil tongues, those people with their evil intentions, they cannot harm us. Rash judgments, if we make judgments uh, quickly, too soon, those judgments will not have a uh, wrong effect on us because nature is our support. Nor the sneers of selfish men, if selfish people laugh at us, they sneer at us, they cannot harm us. He says, and greetings where no kindness is, meaning people, uh, of those, those proud people, even their pride cannot hurt us. And all the dreary intercourse of daily life, and he says all the boring jobs of our daily life, they cannot harm us. Because he says, nothing shall prevail against us. Nothing shall prevail against us. Nothing will affect us or disturb our cheerful faith. Because we, what we have is full of blessings. What we have is blessings and blessings and blessings. So nothing can pollute us, nothing can corrupt us, and uh, nothing can harm us. Because we have nature as a strength, we have nature as our support, we have nature as a protector. So he says, therefore, let the moon shine on thee in thy solitary walk and let the misty mountain winds be free to blow against thee. So he becomes more poetic and poetic and poetic. He says, what does he say? He's expressing his love for his sisters, he says, because he's, he's asked in the previous lines, he asked her to let go of all the worries, to let go of all the tensions, to let go uh, of all uh, evil thoughts, to let go of all uh, the previous uh, faults and to let go of all uh, those ideas, all those feelings that you may have for others in your mind. He says, let go of all the negative things and uh, just be with nature, just be part of the nature and learn from nature and take from nature and forget about those rash judgments, forget about those evil tongues, forget about those sneering people, forget about those pride, proud people and only enjoy, enjoy being with nature, enjoy this nature uh, with me. So he says, he's, he's mentioning some objects of nature, the first one is the moon. He says, therefore, let the moon shine on thee. So when you take long walks, solitary walks uh, about this place, when you're going out for a walk in the lonely nights, he says, let the moon shine on you. Enjoy the beauty of the moonlight and absorb it. The next thing that he mentions is, let the misty mountain winds, the misty, naturally, uh, uh, London itself is a cold place. But, so he says, because it is a valley, it is surrounded by mountains, cliffs from all sides and uh, they must, uh, the wind must be chilly. 
and it was must be misty at night so he says this misty mountain wind let it be free to blow against the he says uh, feel the wind blowing against you he, so wordsworth is basically asking her to share in the nature's blessings and to experience nature like he did in his past and to uh, because by experiencing nature like this she will take something from nature in return like he did uh, so wordsworth basically is was walk, uh, uh, want, uh, wants his sister here to become part of nature then he says and in after years when these wild ecstasies shall be matured into a sober pleasure when thy mind shall be a mansion for all lovely forms thy memory be as a so dwelling place for all sweet sounds and harmonies and later on in the after years when these wild ecstasies shall be matured into a sober pleasure so you see what he is doing here just like he did for himself in the first part he showed you a gradual development in the association of nature uh, for himself here he is talking he is asking Dorothy to go through the same stages he is asking him to go through the same phases he is asking him uh, to learn f the same way that he did so he says these wild ecstasies will later on become develop into a sober pleasures he says so she too will develop an intellectual and moral and philosophical relationship with nature but he says in after years your relationship with nature will have matured like mine did so he's, this is why he uses the words wild ecstasies wild ecstasies ecstasies is extreme joy he says these wild both the words have similar meaning so he, by using them together he's emphasizing it that at the moment you feel uh, uh, these wild emotions when you are in nature you are uh, ecstatic when you are in nature you are too excited so these wild ecstasies he says will later on in with time they will become in, they will become and turn in, or turn into sober pleasure sober pleasure And then he says, when thy mansion, when thy mind shall be a mansion. A mansion is like a, it's a, a, it's a huge living place. You can call it like a, a, a huge house. It's a huge house with uh, uh, too many rooms. Uh, like, maybe like, it's not a palace actually, but it's a big house. So he says, your mind will become a huge house where, which will be able to store all the memory which will be able to store all the memory of all the beauteous parts of nature so it when your mind will become the storehouse when your mind will become the mansion of all these beautiful memories and your mind he says your memory will be a dwelling place for all the sweet sounds and harmonies he calls them the sounds of the streams flowing and the sounds of nature he says your mind will become a storehouse a dwelling place a mansion of the lovely beautiful forms of nature uh, this is what he says will happen to you in later years and then what will happen he says oh then if solitude or fear or pain or grief should be thy portion with what healing thoughts of tender joy wilt thou remember me and these my exhortations so you see now he says when that happens when your wild ecstasies turn into sober pleasures and uh, when you, your mind becomes a dwelling place when it becomes a storehouse of all the beautiful forms it becomes a, uh, beautiful forms of nature and they are stored in your mind as a memory as beautiful memory he says and when you are alone in solitude means when you are alone or when you are filled with fear you are afraid or when you are filled with pain he says or you are filled with grief so if any one of these things should happen to you 
He says, you will remember me and my words, my exhortations are his, uh, these words of his. He says, with what healing thoughts of tender joy will you remember me? So he says, in, in cases, in places when you feel alone, afraid, in pain or in grief, you will remember me and my words because they will have a healing effect on you. So he doesn't mean that actually he will have healing effect on him. What he means is because he's teaching her what nature can do, how nature can heal. So what he actually means is that uh, by learning from his experience, Dorothy can also uh, learn a great deal. Okay, she can also learn to rely on nature as, a, uh, as something that can heal. Nor perchance, next lines, he says, nor perchance if I should be where I no more can hear thy voice, nor catch from thy wild eyes these gleams of past existence, wilt thou then forget that on the banks of this delightful stream we stood together? This is the part which I spoke of earlier on. He's not talking about his death, he says. He's talking about that time in future when he will not be around and Dorothy might be alone in this world without him. So he says, if I should be where I no more can hear thy voice, nor can I catch the, your, uh, the, your wild eyes. So he says, there may be time in future where I cannot hear you. Will thou then forget? But he says, you should remember, you should not forget. He's although asking her, but what he means is that you, you will remember, he hopes that she will remember that they stood together on the banks of this delightful stream. So this delightful stream is the river Y once again. So he says, I hope that our, uh, that nature, that nature, because that is their common pleasure, that nature will remind her of him when she will stand on the bank of this river, when she will st uh, be in this place again, when she will see the beauteous forms again. He says she will be reminded of him. So nature will be, uh, will serve as a reminder. Nature will not let her forget him. And that I, so long a worshipper of nature, hither came unwearied in that service, rather say with warmer love, oh, with far deeper zeal of holier love. Now comes a declaration. You see, he declares himself as a worshipper of nature. He says, I, as a worshipper of nature, he says, you will remember that I, as a worshipper of nature, came to this place. He's talking to nature as if nature is a deity here. Again, he, doesn't, he does not use the word God. He does not say that he is, uh, he's lost his faith now, uh, all of a sudden. He does not believe any uh, God anymore. He doesn't say any of those things, but he simply says, I, I worship nature, and then he portrays it describes it as a deity, as some divine figure, because he says, I came to its service unwearied, without being tired. So in service, you, you use the word, I came in that service as a servant of nature, as a worshipper of nature. And then look at the next two phrases that he uses. He says, with warmer love and with far deeper zeal and holier love. This word is significant, he says, holier love. First it's warmer love, but then warmer love turns into holier love. So it is something more precious. It's not just a passing love. It's not, a, it's not just a, a deep love. It's, it's a warm love, he says, but he, it's more than warm, he says. It is a holier love it is holy, he feels that it is holy and that is why he's, he feels that it was going to last. 
because it is not something uh, that is physical only it's something that is rooted in his soul it's become holy now so he says when he declares himself as a worshipper of nature he says that he came here in servitude and in knowledge of nature's immense blessings he knows that nature can bless a man with a lot nor wilt thou then forget that after many wanderings many years of absence these deep woods and lofty cliffs and this green pastoral landscape were to me more dear both for themselves and for thy sake again he's addressing his sister he says and you will also not forget you will also he says nor will thou for then forget and you will also not forget that after many wanderings many years of absence and you know it is five years absence when he is returned back to this place he says that after uh, uh, years of absence when I have returned to this place this place is special to me he says it is dear to me for itself but it's not just for itself but he says it's also for yourself so you see he's the importance that he's giving to his sister he says for me this place is special the second time because I am visiting this place with you now that you are with me I uh, uh, this place is has become more memorable for me so this this second visit is so much different from his previous first visit when he visited alone and he only found aching joys in nature and he did not have a companion but now he have his he has a sister with him and he says this her presence has made it even more memorable so he is happier that he has visited this special place with a special person so uh, this is a significant this is why this visit is even more precious to him even more significant for him than the first visit and Wordsworth is more indebted to nature now and he's more in, uh, grateful to nature because he feels that um, uh, he has been blessed so much this time upon the second visit so he says this is special for me both for itself and for thy sake with this we come to the uh, end of the poem this was the second part uh, this was the last part of the poem that we uh, analyzed today and you saw that the whole part was dedicated to his sister Dorothy and Wordsworth in fact uh, longs for her to go through the experience in the same way that he went through and to learn from nature as he learned from nature uh, and to uh, 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 take all those blessings from nature that he got from nature so uh, he wishes and he prays that his sister Dorothy should also be bestowed upon with the same blessings that he was by nature we can now look at some of the themes that emerge out of this poem and uh, I think I mentioned in the beginning of the lecture also that the two poems that you have in your uh, course both the solitary reaper as well as this one the Tintin Abbey because they deal with the same idea and they deal with the uh, with the poet's relationship with nature they, the, the themes are similar so when you're attempting question on his relationship with nature you can uh, refer to either of the poems you can refer to both of the poems naturally Tintin Abbey, in Tintin Abbey he discusses the whole process uh, the whole uh, the nature of his association with nature and he, he discusses it in detail but the solitary reaper that poem also offers an insight into his uh, relationship with nature and he uh, it emphasizes for him how and why nature is special for him because uh, how he was mesmerized by the beauty of the scene with the girl singing a song on it it was not just a song alone had this girl been not a country girl a city girl singing somewhere in the city do you think it would have had the same impact on Wordsworth no naturally not Wordsworth was a lover of the beautiful forms of uh, nature the, the girl and this her song they had an impact so, so great an impact on him 
because she was part of that natural world. She Wordsworth saw him uh, part as part of that natural world, uh, singing in the valley, the beautiful valley, working in the fields, the blue skies above, uh, surrounded by tall cliffs, working in the grass fields, uh, in some field, cotton or the wheat fields, and um, harvesting uh, uh, the grain. So it, it was all, all of that that impressed him. And uh, when he moved, when he says towards the end, where that he, as he moved away from that place, it was not just the memory of the girl and her song that he took away with her, but it was everything. It was everything. He does compare the song's beauty to the to Nightingale's song, to the cuckoo song, but he's talking about. But that is only to emphasize the effect of. Uh, uh, of her whole song as part of that natural scene. He says that is, it is greater, it is much, much more powerful than it is, uh, 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 than it is um, when it is part of those two birds, uh, when it, uh, than the song of the two birds, actually. So here also, in Tintinevi, he is exploring his relationship with nature. He discusses his transformation. So the first theme is he explores the impact of passing time on his relationship in nature. When I say he explores the impact of passing time on his relationship in nature, impact of passing time. We're talking about how he felt five years back and how he's feeling now. How this time that has passed how it has changed its relationship with nature. So time has had its effect because when he came here the first time, there was the animal, uh, d there were the dizzy raptures, the coarse, coarser pleasures that he talks about. And then five years passed in the city life where he uh, uh, still remembered the beauty of the place and he yearned to be back there. But then when he returns, he has, is a mature person and he is now disappointed, disillusioned with the French Revolution. He has seen that there have uh, no benefits have come out of uh, that uh, revolution with which all, most of these romantic poets, they had pinned high hopes. He was now disappointed with mankind. He was disappointed with these revolutionary ideas. So he turns his back upon them and he uh, he now looks back, uh, turns back towards nature and he feels that nature has much more to offer. So he's, it's a newer kind of relationship that he now establishes with nature. So f this is one theme that the passing time, uh, the effect of the passing time on him. And the second, another theme is his, uh, which is the similar which is the same as the, this first one. It is his intellectual and spiritual transformation. What's, what's intellectual, spiritual, and I must add here is moral transformation because he does say that nature uh, improves, has imp helped improve his character. And, uh, and uh, so Wordsworth transforms him, uh, Wordsworth feels that nature has transformed him intellectually as well as spiritually as well as morally so nature has changed him transformed him it has helped him along as far as his uh, spiritual moral and intellectual development is concerned so intellectually he has developed morally he's developed spiritually he's developed so intellectually you know, remember when he talks about the power of meditation then when body and uh, mind and body, mind and heart are le left at uh, rest and the soul uh, is connected to the soul of the world and he feels um, that all the burden of the mystery, uh, all the burden of this world is lightened and the, all the mysteries of the world are opened up for him and he can solve the problems of humanity. So that is his intellectual development. And he talks about his moral development and he says, uh, when you're with nature, nature has a moral influence on it. It improves your character. And even there are smaller acts of kindness which we don't remember 
those acts which we don't do consciously most of the time but he says they are also because of the healthy good influence of nature so nature so uh, nature improves character so there is this moral uh, influence of nature then he talks about his spiritual transformation you see so he, he in initially he there was no spiritual link to nature but now he says that he's spiritually transformed he feels the presence in nature he feels connected to nature because uh, he says that uh, there is a spirit in nature which moves and it is everywhere. So wherever, wherever uh, you, you turn to, you will find it and you can take help, you can take guidance, you can take solace from it. So th this, th these are the three uh, forms of transformation. And another theme is his deepening relationship with nature. Again, the same idea, his mysticism, but it, uh, foc I focused uh, upon only the ideas of idea of mysticism and pantheism. And again, let me remind you, mysticism is when he talks about the experience of a mystic, and it was in that second part, and when he talks about how a mystic is, uh, leaves the physical world behind as he is joined to the spirit of the world. And uh, then pantheism is the f uh, when he uh, finds, feels a spiritual presence in nature. Let us look at the idea of pantheism. As I told you, I would uh, discuss it with you towards the end of the lecture. It, uh, it, it is important that you understand what is pantheism and you also understand uh, uh, how Wordsworth used the idea in the poem and how, why is it associated with Wordsworth? Uh, pantheism is not uh, as simple uh, as we think it is. It is, uh, it is sometimes um, to use it profusely for Wordsworth can be misleading, can be wrong in fact. So let's look at the word itself, pantheism. It is the idea of divinity in nature that na there is uh, a divine presence in nature, that nature is divine. All objects of nature, and remember all those objects are not seen separately, they are all one. So he says, all objects of nature, they are all one, and it, nature is divine. It is, it, uh, you can say that it is, it has got a spirit, it is, it is, it is God, but it is divine, they say. Pan actually means everything, and theos means God. So everything is God. Everything in nature is God. This term was first used by an Irish writer, John Tolland, and he first used it in, in the 18th century, in 1705, but he did not use it, uh, uh, talked about it uh, as, as we, are, we, suppo we are supposed to understand it. He derived it from Dutch philosopher Spinoza. And it is Spinoza's uh, concept of pantheism that is relevant here. And I will read it out for you. Spinoza believed that everything that exists in nature is one reality. For him, God and nature were two names for the same reality. God is a natural world and can have no personality. So you see, this is what I was trying to tell you here, that when he says nature is divine, he says there is they do not separate. Spinoza does not separate God from nature. He says nature is God. Everything in nature is God. So nature and God are one thing. They are one reality. God is a natural world and he does not have uh, a personality. He is not uh, something else as we believe that uh, and it, it is there in, in our holy book also that God is Noor, God is light. So we do uh, feel, uh, we do say that he, he does have a separate existence. We don't say that he is, pa that he is the universe. Although uh, for a mystic, ev he doesn't see the physical things. He sees the soul of the things and when he sees them, he connects them to the Lord. But this is uh, the difference. And some of the modern writers who are exploiting this theme, this idea of oneness, this idea of uh, the unity of the natural world and the div divine also 
as part of this natural world. One important name is that of Polo, Polo Coelho and he's uh, the famous writer of a famous word novel, The Alchemist. Uh, some of you may have even heard of it. A very interesting book. So, but in all his works he exploits this theme. He also talks about his heroes are also always in search of, um, of, of their soul. They are searching for the soul of the universe and they're trying to connect to the soul of the universe. Which words what you also see here attempting to do is he searches within and when he finds peace, tranquility him, uh, within, he says he can connect to the soul of the universe. So it, it is this, uh, this is a Western concept of pantheism. This is a Western con concept of, uh, of pantheism. And uh, it's, if it's not uh, as we, uh, it's for it to, it is not suitable for us to use the word God with capital G for it. And the root of the philosophy is that all is one and interconnected. All is one and interconnected. So they do not separate God with uh, the natural world or the natural world with God or the different segments of the natural world, all are one. As Harrison says, in essence pantheism holds that there is no divinity other than the universe. So in pantheism, a pantheist, pantheist belief is there is there is no divinity other than the universe. So the universe, in other words, is a god. It is a deity, god with small g, and it is the deity. So you see the view, the Western concept of pantheism is very different from an Islamic concept of pantheism, which was developed uh, in the 12th century A.D. Uh, by Ibn Arabi, the famous Islamic scholar, a mystic also. And uh, the concept of Wahadatul Wujud, you may have heard of it, is also uh, really associated with him, although it was developed later on in the subcontinent uh, by mm, Sirhin. But actually it is, uh, uh, it was adopted from Ibn Arabi's concept. So, but it is very different from pantheism. Pantheism is associated with Islamic view uh, of pantheism, uh, but there are differences between the two. Okay. Because for a Muslim mystic, for a Sufi, there is only one reality which he calls, which is called Haq, and that is God. God is the only reality. It is not the natural world, which is the center. It is a God, which is the center. So Islamic view is that this universe or nature and everything within it are manifestations of different attributes of God. These are manifestations of different names of God, different qualities of God. These are not the manifestations of God himself. They are the manifestations of different attributes of God. So I gave you first the concept of pantheism. Then we looked at the Islamic view of pantheism and how they differed. Uh, and let me just recap for you this uh, pantheism, pantheistic belief. I uh, would recommend again when you talk about uh, Western concept of pantheism, don't use God with capital G because they're talking about the universe, the natural world as being divine, as being a d uh, as one deity. Uh, but they see the natural world as God with small g. So uh, it, it is, this is uh, pantheism. It is this spirit they see in the universe, the soul of the universe that they call um, the g, God with small g. The Islamic view is different and uh, we do see all the objects of nature as manifestations of God's attributes, not of God himself, but these are manifestations of God attributes as most of the Muslim scholars propagated it and the Sufi mystic mystics experience is also different when he connects with the God he, he, he the all the physical realities are left below and it is the soul which rises and it connects it is again the unity it is oneness uh, the, the he achieves to be one with the reality 
with God, with, uh, with, uh, with Huck, as you call it. But there, they, he remains a subject and God remains a creator. Now let's look at Wordsworth's pantheism. We see that in the poem, Wordsworth does not talk about the personal God. He doesn't talk, uses, use the word uh, God. He doesn't talk about his belief. Or he does not even talk about the biblical God. He, uh, he doesn't talk about the God of the Bible. So he's not talking about uh, uh, his theology. He's not, not talking about his religion. He's not talking about Christianity. He's not confusing his religion with his, uh, when he's describing his relationship with nature. So we should not confuse the two. He talks about the spirit of the universe that is everywhere. So uh, he, he says uh, it lives everywhere, but he is talking essentially. He says that these, uh, because these objects of nature have an influence upon man, they are not inanimate, they must have a spirit. This is all he says. So he says it is a, there is a spirit of uh, this universe and it is everywhere. And it is a result of his deep association with nature that he sees nature as having influence on our lives. So, just like what I said right away. So, this was Wordsworth's view of pantheism. Now, let's see Wordsworth's relationship with nature. Although I have discussed, uh, I discussed this with you uh, through the course of my analysis of the poem, but uh, I have tabulated this again for you here. He, say, he describes the influence of nature on an individual rather than a simple observation of natural phenomena. He is a poet of nature. To show his love for nature, he can simply describe the beautiful scenes for us. He can describe uh, the solitary, a solitary reaper in that beauty, beautiful surrounding and that should be enough. But he doesn't do that. He talks about the influence, the effect of nature on the individual. He tells you about the influence of that natural scene on him, what he felt. So this is an important point. Remember, in his relationship with nature, he always emphasizes his uh, the influence of nature on the individual also, because the beneficiary is the individual. He takes something from nature. Nature influences him. Nature gives him. So it is not a simple observation of the natural phenomena, of the beauties of nature, of the beauteous forms of nature, but it is how nature is an influence on an individual, especially on himself. And in both the poems, when nature was described, the main focus was the response of the poet himself to nature. It's the same, same point that is developed. So we see, as he describes uh, to you, uh, when he's describing nature, he talks how he, first it is how nature influences him, and then he also describes how he responds to nature. What is his uh, response when nature gives him so much? What does he do in the return? In the solitary reaper we saw that he says, he says in the last part that as I mounted up the hill, he still carried the song in his heart. So. Uh, the nature's influence in him was that it gave him happy memories, it gave him happy, healthy recollections, which would uh, take away all his tensions whenever he was faced with some. So, uh, his, uh, what he, how he responded to nature was also important. Just And like in Tintin Abbey, he says, uh, when he was, as a, as a young boy, when he was amongst nature, he would run wild, he would uh, run along the streams, he would climb the mountains like a deer, okay? And then toward in, the, in the second part when he says, as an adult, how he responds to nature, he says, I can hear the still, sad music of humanity in nature. He can hear a presence in nature. He can, uh, uh, he, uh, can meditate in nature. So are his responses to nature. And then Wordsworth's philosophy, man is separable from nature and shares a bond of unity with nature. So, sorry, in Wordsworth's philosophy, man is inseparable from nature. And it, he, sh he shares a bond of unity with nature. So man 
is not different, is not separate from nature. He is part of nature. He is in union with nature. He is part of nature. And he shares a bond with nature. And it is only that we are not aware of this bond. And uh, so he, we need to explore it. And that is what he is advising his sister Dorothy also to do in the last part when he says you need to explore that bond with nature you need to find it you f need to reconnect it and once you found it he says then you will also be you will be as at peace as I am now and it is this idea that he also talks uh, explores in his ode to immortality when he speaks about a child uh, coming into this world he comes with a memory of that bond but as he grows older he says that bond is shattered that it is broken it is the same idea that he speaks of here so with this we conclude our uh, lecture and we also conclude uh, the discussion on Wordsworth and I think I have discussed him in, uh, in quite a lot of detail with you both the poems and uh, we've looked at all the different, uh, we've looked both the poems from all different aspects and uh, we've seen how Wordsworth is so greatly uh, admired as a poet of nature and we have uh, seen how his uh, relationship with nature strengthens and develops and how he has himself explained it in his poem uh, The Tintern Abbey. So we conclude our discussion on Wordsworth. In the next lecture, we're going to begin with uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And uh, we're going to uh, look at his uh, shorter poem, Kubla Khan, first. And then I'm going to look at the ancient mariner with you. So upon this note, I leave you here. Uh, and we, we shall meet again in the next lecture.